works, handle bitch. Social works, social works, social works, social works, social works, social works, social works. Ready or not, here we come. South side, west side, east side, north side. Up on the run, we ain't for the none. We came in the party, we in for the fun. Celebrate life, the party we young. Tigers and limit, we looking above. We up in the sun. No matter what, we stay on the run. Ha, ass work, do your thing. Ass work, keep it lit. Bulls out, keep your A. Yeah, yeah, we up on the jab. Uh. North side, that's the way. Uh. Ready or not, here we come. Uh. Ass work, keep the energy. Look, yeah, we never unplug. Uh. Ass work, show some love. Yeah. Social works. Social works. Social works. Social Social works. Social works. Social works. works what we do social works work social works work social works work social social works work social works work social works social works keep my family at the dirt this organization we stopping no saying and no my we call it works action on tell the killer verse so do my from my city hurt they killing my babies is going crazy i pray for my city to reimburse where the schools for the kids I know it's a swerve, with the heart keep it busy, know the life keep it tricky, but please just let me finish, let me just be a witness, S works handle bitch, social works, social works, social works, social social works, social works, social works, ready or not here we come, south side, west side, east side, north side, up on the run, we ain't for the none, we came in the party, we here for the fun, celebrate life, the party we young, tigers and limit, we looking above, we up in the sun, no matter what, we stay on the run, ha, ass work, do your thing, ass work, keep it lit, uh, bulls out, keep your A, yeah, yeah, we up on the jab, uh, north side, that's the way, uh, ready or not, here we come, uh, ass work, keep the energy, look, yeah, we never unplug, uh, ass work, show some love, yeah. social works, social works, social works, social works, Workshops are a series of online workshops featuring the many incredibly talented friends of Social Works. This series aims to inspire and educate, bringing local and national creatives live to your smartphone. They will be sharing and teaching specific aspects of their craft. A wide variety of professions, interests, and hobbies are represented within our curriculum. Did we mention it's a fundraiser too? The stay at home notice has students wondering what's to come. 
For some, graduation and prom will both be canceled. This campaign will directly fundraise a celebration event for those students within the Chicagoland area. Once it's safe, of course. Tune in to any of our socials for one or all of this workshops. You can find the full schedule of programming at socialworkshy.org or on our Instagram. Classes start Monday, April 13th. We'll see you there. Hi, uh, my name is Carrie Reed. I'm the theater and dance editor for the Chicago Reader. I'm here to talk to you a little bit today about what I do as a critic, uh, how I got into it, and uh, maybe some ideas for those of you who have been interested in pursuing it at some level yourselves. Um, wanted to let you know real quick, all of the uh, S-Works workshops are available. If you go to youtube.com slash social works, you can see all the past YouTubes, everything that's been uh, put out so far. Um, so do that and remember that this is a fundraiser as well. Um, really happy to be talking to all of you today. Uh, like everyone else, I've been socially distanced. I've been at home. Um, haven't been able to get out to shows because the theaters are closed. Uh, so that's been a little bit interesting. Um, I thought I'd start by letting you know a little bit about how I got into writing about theater and the arts. Um, I started out more interested in journalism. I attended the University of Missouri in Columbia, Missouri. They have a really good journalism program there, uh, have had for many years, and it's still one of the top rated. But I'd also always had an interest in theater. Hadn't really done a lot of acting per se, but I had been interested in it. And then uh, I spent a semester studying in London and got to see all kinds of amazing shows. Um, came back from that and thought, yeah, I really, I really want to move more into theater. So I ended up transferring to Columbia College here in Chicago, um, which at that time, I don't think you can do this now, but they were very good about letting you sort of weave your own major, if you will. So I sort of put together uh, a degree that I called communications, because what else was I going to call it, and uh, studied a lot of theater classes, acting, directing, took some improv classes at Second City. Um, and then when I graduated, I started working with some small theater companies throughout the city. Some of them, actually, I think almost all of them are now gone because uh, several years ago. Um, I didn't really get into writing about theater though um, until a few years after I got out of college. And uh, the way I got into writing about it is kind of funny. Um, I think you're all probably familiar with the paper Streetwise, the magazine that um, homeless people sell to raise money. Um, the first executive director for Streetwise was a friend of mine, and he just said, would you mind, you know, volunteering some time and writing about some stuff that's happening in the city, in the arts, because uh, you know people in theater. So I said, sure, okay, I can do that. And um, that kind of lit the fire. I thought, yeah, I, I enjoy this. I enjoyed going back to journalism. Um, I spent most of the 90s living in San Francisco and wrote a lot of different publications there. And... Um, when I moved back in the uh, turn of the millennium, I started writing reviews for the reader and eventually uh, freelanced for the Chicago Tribune. I spent about 17 years there as a freelancer. A lot of my career has been freelance. And then last year, I got hired on as the theater and dance editor at the reader, which means I write, which means I assign stories. I take pitches, you know, suggestions for stories and reviews from other people. I edit those, you know, work with the team of editors at the reader to get it in the paper every week and online. Um, I hope you're all familiar with the reader. If not, this was our fall dance and, uh, win uh, win I'm sorry, winter theater and dance issue. Lots of different articles in there. Um, we were working on a spring one and then the shutdown happened. So um, I'm gonna start, take some questions. Um, I'll start uh, with the second one. Uh, first, uh, somebody asked, what did you enjoy about your time in London and San Francisco? Um, everything, short answer. <laughs> They're both wonderful cities. Um, you know, I think one thing that San Francisco has going for it is um, it's a very adventurous performance scene. It's also um, real easy to get out to nature, you know, to get out to the Redwoods, to get out, you know, to Muir Woods, north of the city. Um, and I found that was a really nice thing. That is maybe one thing I miss about Chicago, because I think if you spend a lot of time in your head or a lot of time writing, um, and I'm noticing this more now since we're all kind of forced to be inside a little bit more, um, you can get a little too introspective. And so it's nice to be able to go, you know, to places and just see other things. Um, 
And there's another question, which this is a big, big question. And I don't know if I have the answer, but someone asks, how do you think theater can adapt in the time of COVID? Um, I'm spending a lot of time right now watching theater online. In some cases, it's older shows that companies had recorded and they're just kind of throwing them up on their YouTube channels or through Vimeo or whatever they have. In some cases, people are creating, you know, new work that they are taping remotely. I just did a piece for the reader last week about um, circus companies that uh, there's a group called Aloft Circus Arts in Chicago, and they've been doing, I think, every two weeks, a show called Sanctuary in Place, and they just have live streams of circus performers from around the world doing stuff, you know, whether it's, you know, you know, uh, fire eating or juggling or, you know, some of them actually do have trapeze things. So um, I started my career as a critic, which I would say is a little different from being a, um, I'm sorry, this is a question that came in. Uh, how did I start my career as a critic? I didn't want to be a critic per se at first. I wanted to be more of an arts journalist, which meant that I was writing more about writing about theater, writing previews of, hey, here's a show that's opening, and this playwright seems kind of cool, and here's what they have to say about their show, or yeah, you know, things like that, because being a critic felt a little, like, you know, because I'd gotten reviews as a performer and a writer, and some of them were very nice, and some of them weren't, and, you know, so I was kind of on that side of it, but more and more I realized if I wanted to keep writing, um, doing criticism was going to have to be a part of that portfolio just for practical reasons as a freelancer. And um, once I started it, I found that I liked it. Um, I did throw up, I don't know if you guys saw it, a, 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 a slide of Anton Ego from Ratatouille. I don't know how many of you have seen that movie. I just love that character because I think he's such a distillation of what people think a critic is, kind of snooty and pretentious and looking to just, you know, tear people down. Um, but there are two things when I saw that movie that really resonated with me that what Anton Ego says that I think have something to say about how to approach criticism. Um, the first is you provide the food, I'll provide the perspective, which I think is kind of the traditional image of a critic that we're sort of a media, kind of immediate force, but mediating force between the artist and the audience. Um, and that's been changing so much in recent years because there is so much online there is so much immediacy. People can communicate with artists directly, you know, uh, through social media, through so many other um, channels that you don't necessarily need a critic to be able to tell you, oh, this is something that's happening and you might want to check it out. Um, but I think there is something to be said for providing perspective. I think what hopefully makes a critic different from just, you know, a Yelp reviewer <laughs> is that you have some knowledge of the thing you're writing about. Um, you have, whether that's a knowledge of the history of the art form, uh, whether that's a knowledge of the subject matter, um, some history with the artists themselves, like maybe you've seen a few of these, play, these plays by a particular playwright or seen a director's work and can kind of tell people, oh, this, this is kind of what their evolution as an artist is. Um, so I think that's kind of part of perspective. But I think that, um, you know, that perspective is also... Uh, going to be influenced by who you are as a person. I know all of us have that experience of seeing a play or a movie or a TV show or whatever it might be, and maybe you loved it and your friend hated it or vice versa, and you have that, did we see the same show kind of moment, right? Um, and the thing is, you never see the same show. I mean, you can be sitting with the person at the same time in the same theater watching the exact same thing, but neither of you are seeing the same show, right? What I'm seeing is going to be informed inevitably by my background. I'm a cis het middle aged white lady. You know? um, I don't have the same experiences as other people. Um, so yeah, I think that it's okay to draw upon that. And increasingly, I think what's great about the way that criticism is evolving is that we're trying to make more room at the table for people who have those diverse voices and those diverse experiences and saying, you know, we can't just have it be this top down thing. Um, so there's a great question somebody just sent in. In the world of social media and Twitter, is the critic more or less relevant? Is everyone truly a critic like the saying goes? Um, yeah, I think everyone is, but I don't, I think it's like anything else. You know, a lot of people throw videos up on YouTube and some of them are really fascinating. You know, not everyone's TikTok is as good as other people's, right? Um, I think what's great about the world of social media and Twitter 
is, is that people can become a little bit more niche. So it's a little easier to find um, work that you're particularly interested in. You can find companies that maybe do work that really speak to your interests. I'm doing a feature right now, actually, next week. Um, the reader has a special issue devoted to games and gaming. There's a company in Chicago called Otherworld Theater, and they've done a lot of shows that kind of reflect gamer culture. Like they did a version of Richard III that was set kind of in the world of uh, Super Mario Brothers. I think you can watch that online. Um, but they're also moving into actually doing, you know, LARPs now on for, for themselves as part of their shutdown, you know, thing. Um, and that's really interesting. I mean, I don't have a lot of knowledge of gamer culture, so that's an example of like, it would be great if somebody who does know that world can talk about it. They may not know as much about theater, but they know a lot about the subject matter and the aesthetics, and that's going to make their voice relevant. So I think it's kind of a mix. I hope that answers the question a little bit, but I think overall it's a good thing. I think it's not great to have just one person at a paper forever telling everybody else, this is, this is good, this is not. Um, process of putting together a review. Very good question. Somebody just asked that. Um, it kind of depends on what the show is. I try to do a little background uh, research. I won't necessarily read reviews of past productions because I don't know that they're that helpful for me. I want to go in as fresh as I can with the idea that I'm seeing this production, you know, because it may be different than it was in New York. Or if it's a brand new world premiere, I want to go to it fresh. I want to try to be like any other audience member. But I also, again, will do a little bit of research to know who the playwright is. Um, I brought as an example, this is a, so you, you get these online a lot now, but this is a press kit that Steppenwolf gave me for a show that I saw shortly before the shutdown um, called I Am Not Your Perfect Mexican Daughter. And it's an adaptation of the book by Erica Sanchez. Now I didn't have time to read the book, but within the press kit, there's a program. They have an interview with the playwright. They have an interview with the, uh, actors who played the lead. And that's kind of helpful, you know, to kind of get a sense of um, what what their experiences were like. One, there, there's an there's a old German poet from the 19th century, and I can't pronounce his name because I'm not good at German, <laughs> Goethe. Um, and uh, he had three rules that you'll see come up a lot about how to review. And it's basically three questions and you're supposed to answer them in order. One is, um, what was the artist trying to do? Did they succeed in doing it? And was it worth doing? And you can't skip those steps. You know, I think if you're approaching a play, I, I, looking at the press kit, looking at the interviews will give me some sense of, this is what the artist is trying to do. And so you wanna take that into account. Um, you, you don't go looking for things in a, in a work of art or in a, in a medium that it's not intended to do. As a friend of mine put it, you don't go to a pizza parlor and then complain that their sushi is terrible. <laughs> that's not the point. You you know, you can evaluate the pizza, but that's what you're there for. Um, so that's the first thing, giving a fair shake to the, uh, the artist. What do I think they're trying to do with this work here? Um, did they succeed at it? That's where a lot of your own viewpoint comes in. You know, maybe somebody sees a piece and thinks, wow, this is really great. But maybe from your perspective, you're like, you know, I feel like it's maybe a little bit racist or sexist, or, you know, it's, it's got some sort of transphobic messages that maybe the artist wasn't aware of. And it's fair to bring that in. You know, that's part of being the reviewer is bringing that in. It doesn't mean you have to be canceling them, but it's just, you know, putting up the flag and saying, hey, wait a minute, there's this thing in this, there's this moment in this movie or in this play that kind of bothers me and I want to I want to call it out and I want to talk about it um and then the third question is it worth doing that's a hard one you know again that gets into what's your aesthetics I mean I don't like work that I feel is too easy too preachy too obvious um you know I don't think anybody needs a play to see uh you know to find out that I don't know that the genocide is bad we all know genocide is bad right um, so those are those. That's how kind of how I approach doing a review, trying to be as fair as I can to what I think the intent of the artist or artists are. Um, um, I have a great question from uh, it's uh, Lenny on Point on Instagram. I've been told I have an ear. Uh, I've been told I have an ear for it, and I love sharing promoting the work. But I'm on the fence at times because I'm not a musician. Is it acceptable for me to review the music? Um, absolutely. It's always acceptable to review. Um, 
because we all do it. First of all, everybody's reviewing now. I mean, as we were, we were talking about, everybody's a critic. Um, I think if you're looking to do reviewing professionally, um, there's no problem with not necessarily being a practitioner. So there's no problem with you not being a musician. Um, a lot of really good critics don't necessarily do the thing that, you know, um, that they're reviewing. It, it can be helpful, um, but I don't think it's necessarily an impediment. Um, I mean, people write about politics who are not politicians, right? I mean, people write about the Supreme Court who are not necessarily Supreme Court justices. <laughs> and that doesn't mean that they can't evaluate or, or provide analysis. So I'd say, yeah, absolutely. You shouldn't feel... Um, you know, in, in, in feel like, oh, well, I don't know enough, you know, and there, conversely, there are also people who are very good at making art, but who aren't necessarily that good about writing about it, about why it works or like explaining it to, you know, a more general audience. So, um, I have not one other question here. Uh, if you like the freelance world, you, you took on a nine to five schedule, which did you prefer? Um, I like both. I'm really grateful right now that I have a full-time regular job at the reader because with the cratering of, um, you know, so many events, I mean, a lot of, as you all know, a lot of well, theaters, restaurants, bars, music clubs, they're all closed. Um, the reader's trying real hard to stay, stay open. Um, we're switching to a nonprofit model, which I think will help. So we're not as dependent on advertising. Um, for me personally, it's worked out better right now to be full time because I get my benefits. You know, it's harder and harder to find those jobs. I mean, and this was going on for a long time before COVID hit. Um, and again, you know, advertising revenues have dried up. Um, it's just a lot of papers have been folding. The Tribune got bought by a hedge fund, and a lot of their people are furloughed right now. So it's it's some crazy times. You know? So we're just all kind of waiting to see what happens next. Um, Oh, this is a real interesting question. What are your thoughts on critics who, through their work and critique, become more famous and notable than the artists they are reviewing? Wow. Um, you know, I'm trying to think. You know, there there have been some superstar critics over the years. You know, certainly like Siskel and Ebert. You know, became kind of the big, you know, media thumbs up, thumbs down people. Um, I guess it's like anything else. If if they're if they're sincere and honest in how they approach the work, which doesn't necessarily mean they love everything and they're giving everybody, you know, you know, at a, you know, at a boys, at a girls, whatever it might be, then I think that's fine. Um, I think what Siskel and Ebert, for example, did with their TV show was make the language of cinema more accessible to people. Um, and I, I mean, maybe this is just me, but I kind of feel like people talk more now about you know, cinematic terms and things like that. And I think it may have been helped in part by the fact that they had such a high profile. We're helping people just, okay, what am I seeing and why does it matter? Um, so in terms of if those, for those of you who are looking to do this as a career, um, I'm going to be honest, it's real tough right now. And as I said, it was tough before the COVID thing hit. But at the same time, there are more opportunities to just start writing, whether you're blogging, whether you're podcast, you know, you don't, I shouldn't even say writing, I should say reviewing, whether you're podcasting, um, whether you want to do, you know, things through your own social media channels. Um, I'd say the first place to start is with, with something that you, that you already know that you really like. It doesn't mean that you have to love everything within it, but, um, don't, don't try to review something that you don't know a lot about. Start, you know, start with a more familiar and then maybe branch out from there. Um, but and, and I think a really good tool for a critic is to be able to feel comfortable saying, I don't know. You know, sometimes I th see things, I think, I'm not really sure. I'm not sure what the artist is trying to do. I mean, and, and sometimes they'll tell you more than, you know, sometimes you get a great little program note. Sometimes you don't. You know, sometimes you're like, uh, they're not really telling me what I, this play is about. It's not, you know, super linear. Um, so there, it's very symbolic and I'm trying to draw things out. And I think it's okay to, as a writer, to just say, some of this I just wasn't sure I got, but this was interesting. It reminded me of this painting that I really love. Or I think the story that they're kind of weaving in this sort of kind of nonlinear way reflects 
how fractured we are in the age of social media or whatever it might be, you know. Um, so, oh, this is a good question. What are some of your favorite directors, choreographers working in Chicago today? The one that comes to mind immediately is um, Lillian Brown. She was she directed uh, School Girls, the African Mean Girls play, which is I think you can see it on a paid basis right now at the Goodman Theater. It was in previews, which means it was right before the opening night, but it was on stage. It had audience. They had recorded it. And then the COVID shutdown hit. Uh, Lillianne is amazing. Um, she's directed musicals. She directs new work. Um, she directed The Color Purple out at Drury Lane Oak Brook last fall, which I didn't get a chance to see, but that got rave reviews. She's just really smart and she picked some really great uh, really great pieces. So she's one of my favorites. Um, I have a lot of others, but I just saw her show last night. So <laughs> it's so maybe it's like whoever I just saw and really love, that's my favorite, right? Um, somebody asked if I can't get a job at a paper or a prominent blog, where can I post my own reviews? You know, get, you could get your own website. You could, you know, I know people who just post stuff on Facebook, you know, they just have their, fa or, or in, you know, whatever account that they're most comfortable with. Uh, I think Facebook, you have longer word counts, so maybe that works for them. You know, you want to get a WordPress. Um, Chris Beyer, who has been a critic in Chicago for a while, he was the editor at Time Out, uh, theater editor at Time Out Chicago. He started his own blog called Storefront Rebellion. And from that, I think he went on to Gaper's Block, which is no more. And then he was at Time Out for a number of years. Now, unfortunately, you know, he's become a you know, a victim of all the various cutbacks, but he, st but he went back to his storefront rebellion. He has a newsletter now. So, um, so I, I can't promise that there's a great income stream right now for this, but there are great opportunities to write and hone your craft, uh, which is true for artists in Chicago too. You know, it's not a great place necessarily to make a ton of money as an artist, but it's a great place to start out. And it's a great place to just do a lot of work and meet a lot of people, um, which is a big, big part of the learning process, I think. Um, besides Steppenwolf and the big theaters in the loop, where are some great places to check out plays once they are up and running? Um, I would say, um, and this will be tooting my own horn, but if you went back when theaters, when, when, when theaters are back and running again, we do some pretty extensive listings at the Chicago Reader, and we have reviews of almost everything, so you can check us out, chicagoreader.com. Um, there are a lot of places that do, that host a lot of smaller theaters, like the Den in Wicker Park on Milwaukee Avenue. They, they're like, I think, a five or six theater complex. They have a bar, cafe, and they have a lot of different uh, companies, some that are like in residence and produce there pretty regularly, others that maybe will just come in for a show or two. Um, and they've got a really interesting mix of, of companies there. Um, it is, I would say one thing about Chicago right now, as with everything else, we tend to be pretty segregated, as we all know. And the theater tends to be uh, disproportionately represented on the north side. And I think that that's something to be addressed, which means that, you know, culturally, you know, I know there are organizations that are working on that, but it's something to be aware of. Um, like it be, it's great if you can try to find those companies that are just kind of just starting out or aren't already kind of getting a lot of attention. Um, somebody asked, how did you develop your own voice as a writer? Um, I think it, a lot of trial and error, like with everything else. When I first started writing reviews, I think I approached them more journalistically because I was a little bit afraid of actually having an opinion or saying this doesn't work for me and here's why. I was more about being descriptive and being descriptive is great. Being able to give a great detail is a wonderful thing, um, you know, to make people feel like they're in the room, especially for theater or live concerts or dance or anything that's live because, you know, even if it's captured on video later, it's not exactly the same as, as being in the room. So your job, a lot of it is to capture that energy or to give people like a really good portrait in words of what they're looking at. Or, or what I was looking at. Um, so what I would say is try to avoid, or what I had to teach myself to avoid, was writing what I call laundry list reviews, where I would just sort of, I you know, talk about every every actor, talk about every design element, I describe it and say, oh, this was, you know, this was really pretty, and this person's really funny, and yeah, it's like, but it didn't really tell anybody any, anything about the show. 
So I think for a review, I try to think of it as I'm trying to tell a story about what I saw. And I try to think of it as maybe I'm sitting down and I'm talking to a friend and I assume they're a pretty smart friend. I don't have to talk down to them, but they just happen to have not seen the thing that I just saw. So what would be the most important things that I could tell them? You know, I do have limitations on word count and things like that that I have to take into account once, you know, I get the whole thing written and I have to edit it down. But when I start in, it's like, what do I want people to know about this show? Um, this is a great question. How can producers help bring plays and performances to the South and West Sides? Well, I want to, I want to, I should backtrack and say there are things that are happening. There are companies that are producing there. Um, there is a theater, um, uh, Ricardo Gamboya, I think has a company, I want to say back of the yards. Um, and I can send information on that to, to social works after this. Um, there's, you know, there have been places on the West Side, Agua Home Theater. Um, is a wonderful uh, Latin Latinx theater, primarily producing in Spanish, and they're in uh, Belmont Cragen area. Um, they just don't tend to get the same support. Um, so I think, you know, a big thing that's been happening, I know the Arts and Business Council of Chicago has been um, looking to share resources and bring kind of producers to exactly those areas and looking at existing venues like um, Park District field houses or other places that are already there. So you don't have to worry about, you know, small companies having, certainly they're not gonna have the resources to build something necessarily, but to give them, you know, some level of stability so that they can produce and build a presence in the neighborhood. Um, I think that's one good thing to do is just when everything opens up again, look local, look around your neighborhood, see who's doing stuff, you know, whether it's your bars, your restaurants, music clubs, art galleries, um, that really makes a difference when people just walk in. And, you know, the thing, especially about small theaters, they're delighted when people show up who aren't necessarily friends of theirs and they'll talk to you. You know, you're not gonna be able to go to Steppenwolf and probably talk to, you know, a famous person after the show. Small theaters, you know, you can probably say, hey, are you guys, are you guys hanging out? Are you going to the bar down the street? Can I, because I want to talk to you about this show. Or I want to find out more about what you guys are doing. And I think that personal connection can just be a really wonderful thing uh, for audiences and arts groups, um, you know, because that's what makes theater special to me. It's immediate. It's like right there, you know, they are doing it for me live right there in that moment. And it cannot be replicated or repeated. Even the same show the next night is going to feel a little bit different. You know, every performance is a little bit different. Any of you who have performed or, you know, you know what I'm talking about. So um, somebody says, uh, what are some exciting trends going on in recent theater and dance productions you'd like to continue? Um, any tropes you'd like to see? End? <laughs> okay, so like this is a trope that I think was really hilarious and I didn't come up with the name for it. Um, there was a play done a couple years ago by a company in Chicago called First Floor Theater, and it was called Two Mile Hollow uh, by a woman named Leanna Naka Winkler, who is Hapa, uh, Asian Pacific uh, American, and uh, I think her father is white and uh, her mother's Japanese. And uh, she wrote this play and called it The White People by the Water Play. It, it, the play is called Two Mile Hollow, but the category is white people by the water. And the whole premise is it's this family and they're very wealthy and they're very dysfunctional and dad's just died. And we're going to our summer home on Martha's Vineyard to deal with our feelings and how angry y'all are at each other. And like, I have seen that play so many times, <laughs> but the brilliant thing about Leia's play is that she required that all the characters be played by actors of color. And it just made the ridiculousness and the privilege of this world that much more apparent. So yeah, that's a trope that, you know, when it's not being sent up as skillfully as Leia did it, um, that could die. Like just basically rich white people sitting in their living rooms complaining about their lives. I'm kind of done with that. Um, but trends, I think there's a lot of interesting trends as far as uh, people doing more site specific work. We have a piece up by a writer named Brandon Sward on the Reader uh, website right now about site-specific dance and performance, you know, people using galleries. Uh, the Art Institute has a whole performance series. I think it's called Artists Connect, where artists are inspired by a particular piece within the collection, and they do a piece of work around that. Um, I think that's really exploding the idea of we come in, we sit down, and it happens right, you know, in front of us, and that's fine. I enjoy those shows too, but when you have something that's a little bit more immersive, um, it kind of put, makes you feel like you're much, much more invested in what's going on, I think. Um, 
Wait, somebody said there's a theater in Hammond. In, yeah, I believe there is a theater in Hammond. I don't know that I have been there, but um, yeah, my, my catchment area doesn't so much now take me. Uh, we do cover some suburban theater, um, but uh, yeah, the, the important thing to remember about theater is that um, not everybody has access to it. And I think it's a, that, that's one thing that when I've been talking to people since the shutdown, like a lot of places are offering classes now online. And uh, the instructors I talk to will say, it's amazing, but I get people who come from very small towns who are like, I don't have a place to study improv, you know, but I can do this online improv class or story writing, you know, telling class or dance class. And I don't have that kind of access in my town. You know, so we talk a lot about accessibility in the arts and um, sometimes it's being accessible for people with disabilities. A lot of companies now will do shows for people who um, are neuroatypical, you know, th that are geared for, you know, those sensitivities, not just uh, for younger audiences, but for other, um, you know, adult audiences as well. But it's also about just understanding that, you know, somebody earlier asked what I loved about London and San Francisco, and particularly with London, because that was my first experience of actually living in a city. I didn't move to Chicago until after that. It's like, there's so much. You're just spoiled, right? It's like, oh my gosh, pick up a, you know, go with no internet at the time. So I was picking up a magazine, Time Out or whatever. I'd be like, oh my God, I don't even know what I want to do tonight. There's so much. Um, so I think that, yeah, just, um, I got off track. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, just try to remember that, you know, that people who are doing theaters in small towns and, you know, I, I think this ties back with something else that Anton Ego said at one point in Ratatouille. At the very end, he says something about, or near the end, he does the review and he loves the dish and the rest, what the restaurant's doing. He said, the new needs friends. And I think that's true. I, and again, I don't think that means that you have to absolutely love everything because these plucky little artists have no money and they're renting the barn and doing that. But I think it does mean that you have to be sensitive to the fact that doing something new always takes a leap of faith. I think it takes courage to get in front of people and act and perform and show them this is who I am, you know, in all your physicality. Um, so there's something uh, one of my editors from early on uh, back in the day said that he sent kind of guidelines to his new reviewers. And he had a line about just always remember that no matter how much you may dislike a show, you will never spend as much time writing about it as the people who put it together did putting it together. And again, that's not saying you know, participation trophies or whatever, you know, nonsense we talk about with that. It just means being fair, keeping perspective. And especially if it's a new piece, um, you know, it, you know, it may not be perfect. It may have, you know, it may be transcendent, who knows? Um, but it means that you do want to try to um, be fair to it, you know, and really understand what it's trying to do and not be dismissive. I would argue that a review that's not so positive, but that fairly engages with the work and really talks about this is what I, again, we're back to those, what are they trying to do? How well did they do it? Was it worth doing? If you really engage with those questions, then at least you're honoring the, the attempt. You're honoring the work. You're not just saying, I don't get this. Next. You know, that that's, it can be fun to write slams, I guess. I've never really been that kind of critic. I mean, there are some really nasty reviews out there that I secretly read and giggle at because I'm human like anyone else. But in terms of writing, I think it's it's more of a challenge for yourself to always, even if you think the artist isn't working at the top of their intellect, if you're writing about them, try to work at the top of yours. I don't know if that makes sense, but I feel like that's a rule for myself. Like always just try to be thoughtful and engaged. Um, oh, Tau Theater, Morton School of Performing Arts. Oh, that's good to know. Thank you. Uh, somebody just sent me the name of the theater in Hammond. Towel, T-O-W-L-E Theater. Um, that's the great thing about this job. I'm always finding out about new new, new venues that are out there. Um, I think this is a question. How can patrons have face-to-face -face moments with the actors and directors of plays? Um, you, know, it, it, you know, some actors and directors are more open to talking to patrons than others. Again, I think your chances of doing that are much greater at a smaller theater. Um, but you know, I, a lot of them will even put their email addresses or say, Hey, this is how you can reach out to me. I'd love to hear your thoughts about the show. And I would say, if you're going to do that, be polite. Obviously nobody wants to get, you know, nasty grams in their email box. Um, 
and I think it's easier in a place like Chicago. I do feel like the Chicago theater community and, uh, and dance community too are much more, um, you know, open to their, to their patrons. I think because they have to be, they don't, you know, they're not operating on the biggest world stage. So they're, they're very, you know, um, interested in engaging with patrons. The biggest, oh, this is a fun question. Okay. Now talking about nasty reviews, the biggest train, what's the biggest train wreck you've seen in person? Did you write a bad review? Did the production recover? This was back in San Francisco. Somebody did a musical based on invasion of the body snatchers. Um, and it was marketed as kind of like a little shop of horrors, like a very campy, fun musical, you know, send up. And it was not. They were deadly serious about it. The songs were awful. Um, it was just kind of really uncomfortable to sit through the whole thing. I don't think I wrote a really super nasty review. I mean, it was not a positive review. Um, that It was for a smaller publication, so I don't know if it really suffered the production itself. Um, you know, it's, it's hard to say now how reviews hit. I think the Tribune giving a four-star review to something still helps it a lot. Um, it's a little harder. I mean, it, it, if you're doing a show, it's easy to ask people, why did you come to my show? Because the Tribune gave it four stars. Okay, that helped us. But you can't really like go up to people who aren't going to your show and ask them why they're not going to your show. <laughs> so it's, it, you know, it's a little hard to say what, um, you know, what hurts, what helps. But yeah, no, that was a bad show, this Invasion of the Body Snatchers. And then, I don't know, just a few weeks after I reviewed it, I ended up having to, for a different story call the actor who played the lead and he was actually good so i was able to fairly say that he did a good job you know that in this train wreck of a show and i had, i left a message for him i thought I don't know if he's gonna want to talk to me because i didn't like that show and he called me back and it was actually very funny he said thank you for that review everything you said about that show were, were the things that i was telling the director all along and like you i had been told that we were taking this very you know, campy, tongue-in-cheek approach. And once I got into rehearsal, I found out we were not, and I just didn't feel ethically that I could drop out at that point, but I really wished I had. So, you know, sometimes artists know even better than you do when things are not working the way they should. Um, great dance performances. Um, you know, I really don't get to dance as much. We do, Irene Shaw, who is our dance critic at The Reader, does an amazing job. Uh, covering a lot of that. Um, but I think uh, Lucky Plush is kind of a hybrid dance um, theater company. They do some really interesting work. Hubbard Street Dance Chicago, which is one of the biggest, you know, most well-known modern dance companies in the city and the country, they're actually doing some virtual performances um, live. I think one starts tomorrow, so you can, uh, that they've choreographed and people are performing from their homes. Um, and we have an article about that online at the reader. So that's, that's something to check out. I really, as an old fashioned kind of girl, I do, you know, I thought I'd seen the Nutcracker, didn't want to see it anymore. Um, I do think the new Joffrey version is really interesting. The one they did, uh, I think maybe three years, three or four years ago, they revamped it. And now it's a story set in the world of the, um, 1893 World's Fair. So, um, and that's an interesting example of, taking a beloved chestnut and reinventing it, which happens a lot in theater and dance and ballet, especially, you know, the stories are always there, but people revamp them. Shakespeare, particularly. I mean, that's a big example. I mean, I've seen things like uh, Julius Caesar done as a commentary on Malcolm X's assassination, for example, and that was a lot of fun. Um, you know, they don't make Shakespeare's not going to sue. It's all in the public domain. <laughs> some some playwrights, you know, you can't really mess with their works because they own the rights and they're not going to let you make big changes like that. But, you know, other places you can. So this is a great question. What is the relationship like between the reviewer and the artist? Is it one sided or do you frequently have contact with directors and performers? I would say it used to be more one sided. Um, I mean, not that I went out of my way to be antisocial, but I don't like hang out at opening night parties. I, I figure they want to hang out with their people. They don't need to see me there. Um, but I will say the advent of social media, like once I got on Facebook several years ago, which I was resistant to at first, um, I found all these actors and art, you know, theater people and performers were sending me 
friend requests. And I thought, well, they know what I do. So, okay. I wouldn't send friend requests to them. That was, that's always been my rule. It felt like a little intrusive for me as a critic to ask them to be my friend. I didn't want them to feel put on the spot, you know? Um, but it's been interesting because we engage with each other in a different way on social media. Sometimes it's about theater. Sometimes it's about, you know, things that aren't related to a specific production. It might be, wow, this, you know, there hasn't been as much diverse casting going on as we would like to see, or here's some funding issues or things that are not related to theater, you know, directly at all. Just, I mean, there's, God knows there's plenty in the political world for us all to be kind of sharing ideas and viewpoints on. Um, and I think it's actually, from my reluctance to do it, I fully embraced it because I think it reminds us all that we're all human, we're all in this together. And particularly as the, you know, as the uh, media landscape gets more fraught, I think most of us are in the same position as I said, I think I said earlier, as a lot of the artists, you know, we're just scrambling gig, not me right now, fortunately, we'll see what happens, but we're all scrambling gig to gig to gig, you know, and I think that that may be gives us a point of connection and a point of empathy. And I don't think empathy is ever a bad place to start when you're reviewing. Again, you don't have to, you know, give, you know, kisses and bouquets to everything you see. But if you are starting with the place of, I'm really going to try to understand what this artist is doing to the best of my ability and be honest about it. Um, I think that that more often than not wins you a fair amount of respect. Um, and sometimes when you're on, as I, as I cited with that story about the, uh, uh, invasion of the body snatchers train wreck, you know, the artists themselves would be like, thank you. Somebody had to say it. I'm glad it was you. So, um, what dance school would you recommend in Chicago for classical ballet study? This is a little out of my wheelhouse. I mean, the Joffrey is great. I know you have to audition and it's world class. So I don't know how easy that is. Um, but I know there's places that are doing classes now. Hubbard Street is doing classes. That's not so much classical ballet, but um, I would say, you know, do a little Googling around and see if right now, especially a lot of them are doing drop-in classes. There is um, a website, if you're not familiar with it, called cchicagodance.com, S-E-E, -E, C Chicago Dance. And that's a really good um, resource. And they have a whole calendar of classes virtual performances going on right now. So that might be a good place to start to just get a sense of, you know, and I would say the best place to study isn't necessarily always the best place. It has to be the best place for you. Um, you know, I have friends who are artists who are saying, you know, I have a friend who's a trained singer who was like, some of the places that I was auditioning to study for my master's, they were like on paper, a great school, but I did not get a good feeling for them. And I just didn't think I want to, you know, that I wanted to spend two years of my life in a place where I didn't really feel like I fit or that I would be as supported. So that's an important thing to remember too. Um, why do some great film TV actors spend long stretches dedicated to a theatrical production? Um, you know, I think that, um, especially in Chicago, it's such an ensemble town from places like Steppenwolf, which was formed by a bunch of friends to Second City, which was also formed by originally by a bunch of college friends at University of Chicago. I think people find their tribe, you know, they find that it's their family. Um, I think you all know who Michael Shannon is, who was uh, Nelson Van Alden on Boardwalk Empire. He was uh, Zod in, in Superman. I mean, he's done a, a bunch of things. His little company, a Red Orchid Theater, is on Wells Street in Old Town, and he comes back and does shows, directs, or he performs, I think, at least once a year. He lives in New York now, but um, I think they come back because, you know, um, I haven't done film acting, but the people I talk to do it say it's, it, it is, it's really technical film acting. You know, it's like, can you hit your mark? Can you remember how you set the line? Can you find your light? And that's great, and of course, you get paid tremendously well. I, there's a great quote from Peter O'Toole, who I think actually did the voice for Anton Ego, by the way, so tying that together. Um, he was asked one time, the late great British actor who played in Lawrence of Arabia, you know, what these crazy salaries the film actors get compared to stage actors. And he said, well, the thing about film is I act for free. They pay me to wait because that's what you do a lot on film sets. Whereas when you're doing a play or a performance, you kind of get to go through that whole arc of the story. You go through the rehearsal process and then every night you get to tell that story fully and live in front of people and you get that energy and you feed off their energy. And I think that's the reason uh, people come back and then you add on to that the fact that 
so many people came out of ensembles in Chicago and it's like anything else, man, you just want to come back and play with your friends. It's kind of like, you know, why do musicians go and, you know, gig with people they used to play with? Because like, you understand me, you know, this is fun. We have the same, you know, kind of chemistry going on and it's just, you know, frees me up in a way that staying in a studio all day maybe wouldn't. So ensemble cast, okay. An ensemble cast is more, somebody asked, what do I mean by that? Um, it's more, the whole group of actors, it's not so much like, and here's the star turn, here's, you know, uh, Bette Midler and Hello Dolly, and then everybody else. You know, it's, uh, I mean, there are definitely starring roles, but ensembles tend to be people who work together a lot. They'll do shows or seasons together. You know, Steppenwolf, some of the people come in and out, like Laurie Metcalf and some of the founders have been, you know, off in Hollywood for years. But, you know, they tend to get to know each other. They tend to... Uh, sometimes the directors will want to cast the same people because they get to know them. And like, this person really understands how I work. Um, and I think, I think, again, they're common in Chicago because people realized they needed to tribe up that, you know, when a lot of these theaters started, Chicago wasn't getting a lot of attention as a theater town. It was kind of a flyover city. You get touring productions, you know, from, you know, Broadway, which we still do. Um, but they realized if we were going to create work, we needed to kind of, you know, really bond together and uh, kind of stick it out through the long haul. And everybody was doing everything. I mean, that's kind of the thing with small theaters. And I have a little bit of experience with that. Um, you know, everything from cleaning the bathrooms to taking the tickets <laughs> to painting. Um, and I think that, that that can be a good way. That's a good, good opening, good training ground. You may not want to stick with it forever, but I think it gives you a sense of rootedness. Um, as to why the work matters to you. Um, somebody asks, um, why do some theater actors not transition into film as well? Same questions why some plays not translate well to movies. Um, boy, I don't know. You know, I'm trying to think there are, I think there are some theater actors who just really love doing that. And maybe, you know, they have a certain resentment for the process of making movies? I don't know, uh, That's I, I think you'd have to ask them. I'm not sure I'm comfortable speaking for them, but I think some plays that do not translate well into movies, um, one I can think of is Doubt, the movie that came out several years ago with Meryl Streep and Philip Seymour Hoffman, where she's the mother superior who thinks that Philip Seymour Hoffman's character, the priest, has been molesting a boy. I saw that as a play first, and in the play it's all in the mother superior's office. So you don't get to see a lot of the outside world. And I thought that was great because the whole play is asking you, who do you believe? And the less you see, the more doubt you have. And when I saw it on film, it just didn't play the same for me. Um, so I think sometimes it's about the world. You know, if you open up a story too much and bring in too many outside things, you kind of lose the focus. That might be one reason. Uh, what are some cities that have great theater and dance performances? Oh gosh. Uh, well, San Francisco, New York, obviously. Minneapolis is a great, has been a great theater town for a while. Um, Austin, Texas has some really good stuff. There's so many. Um, Boston, Philadelphia. I was in Philadelphia a few years ago for a, a workshop and um, got to see a lot of stuff and some really interesting plays coming out of there. Um, but that's the thing, you know, I don't get to see as much from other cities. I'm mostly based in Chicago. And that's been the one good thing with the shutdown is that I can go online to, you know, a company in Houston, be like, oh, hey, <laughs> I can watch a play from this company from Houston I've never seen before. What kinds of stories are best told on stage? All of them. Honestly, I don't, I think if you have the right artists, any story can be told on stage. Um, and uh, the, sto the stories that I love are the ones that I've not seen before or that have kind of suggested something, even if it's a story I think I'm familiar with, like a play that I've seen before, but they find a different take on it, then I'm like, oh, I never thought about that character like that. Um, like I saw a production of uh, of Mice and Men several years ago, and I don't know how many of you know that story, but there's this character, Curly's wife, and she's always kind of depicted as kind of, kind of a floozy, kind of, you know, very brassy. And in this production, she was like, they made her very mousy. She was like this very quiet, kind of shy woman who's just really, really lonely. She's surrounded by men on this ranch. She has no friends. And so it's like the men are misinter were misinterpreting her overtures to them. And it was like, oh, I never thought about that with that character. And I'd seen that play four or five times before. And that, you know, so when people do something like that, it's like, ah, ah, you just flip my mind around and that's pretty cool. So 
Ah, uh, favorite player dance performance. Gosh. You know, I I don't know if I have a favorite. You know, I have like things that have really stuck with me. When I was in London, I got to see Judy Dench in Bertolt Brecht's uh, Mother Courage and Her Children, which is like a modern classic. And I'd never heard of it before, really. I mean, I, I certainly hadn't heard of her because she hadn't become big in the United States yet. And she was just so amazing. So that was like my first like, oh, oh, this is what great stage acting is. This is what great acting is, period. Um, so that stuck with me because I was, you know, it was kind of a very moment, you know, momentous time. Um, so, yeah, um, you know, I think that if you're planning on doing this, I think read up on things. Read reviews, that helps. I mean, it's like if you want to write murder mysteries, you're probably going to read a few murder mysteries to get a sense. Maybe find a few critics that you like and follow them, you know, whether they're music, dance, whatever it might be. Doesn't mean you have to imitate them, but get a sense of what their voice is like. And then don't be afraid of putting your own voice in there. Don't, you know. Um, I started working with the reader uh, as a freelancer because the then theater editor had taught at Columbia College and I hadn't had classes with him. But once he realized I was a Columbia kid, that helped. So I hate to say it, but sometimes it's who you know. <laughs> I mean, I'd been writing. I had a lot of clips um, from my time in San Francisco. And you know, I worked off and on with the reader. Well, mostly freelance. I had a full-time job there for about three years, also doing listings and things like that. Um, and this last time coming back was mostly right place, right time. I was doing some freelance copy editing for them and they had decided to open up a new full-time position as a theater and dance editor. And I was there. <laughs> they just said, you're already writing about this for us. Do you want to maybe interview for this job? So, um, so I just, I just got very lucky and I feel very grateful every day. I mean, that's the thing about being a critic. It's like, I can grouse about the time it takes or things that aren't so good, but my God, it's a, it's a pleasure and a privilege to write about art. Um, my connections with Columbia, I graduated from there back in 1980 something, I won't tell you. <laughs> so, and I taught there for a little bit as well. I taught um, reviewing the arts there for a few years. So, um, any other questions? I know I've kind of been all over the map here, but you know, it, it, it's the toughest time ever to make a living as a critic. It's the easiest time ever to start doing criticism and reviewing. Um, so I don't know if that's comforting or not, but um, you know, we're all at this kind of at this pause button point with media and everything else right now in the arts and the shutdown to see what comes next. So, um, but I know artists will prevail and artists will be telling some great stories. And it, I hope I'm there to help talk about the stories they tell. Uh, she, Chicago Dance, uh, theaterinchicago.com, T-H-E-A-T-R-E in Chicago.com. Somebody asked about another resource. That's another great one. They have review roundups, articles, listings. So that's another place. Plus, I, of course, the Chicago Reader. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So thank you all. I've really enjoyed uh, having your very thoughtful questions. And um, I hope well, I'll get to see some of you at the theater soon. I don't know how long it's going to take for things to reopen. We, we want it to happen safely. But um, someday it'll, you know, we'll all we'll be out there together. And I think it'll be pretty joyous when it does happen. And uh, please remember to support the uh, Social Works uh, fundraiser for uh, the virtual, yeah, for the uh, prom and graduation party that will happen once everything is back to uh, back to being open and normal again. So, keep my family at the dirt. This organization, we stopping no Satan and open my we call it works. Action on and tailor the killer verse. I do all my food in my city hurt. They killing our babies, this world going crazy. I pray for my city to reimburse. Run the schools for the kids. We the city and we lady. All I know is it's work. With the heart, keep it busy. Know the life keep it tricky. But please just let me finish. Let me just be a witness. S works, handle bitch. Social works. Social works. Social works. Social works. Social Ready or not, here we come. South side, west side, east side, north side. Up on the run, we ain't for the none. We came in the party, we here for the fun. Celebrate life, the party we young. Tigers and limit, we looking above. We up in the sun. No matter what, we stay on the run. Ha, ass work, do your thing. Ass work, keep it lit. Bulls out, keep your aim. Yeah, yeah, we up on the jab. Uh. North side, that's the way. Uh. Ready or not, here we come. Uh. Ass work, keep the energy. Look, yeah, we never unplug. Uh. Ass work, show some love. Yeah. Social works.
social works 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 yeah yeah s works s works everyone put their hands you know it's a vibe they're waiting in line to get up and flood up the stands yeah we in this together we feeling like fam it's all about peace so pull up with fans you better come through with you and your crew cause everybody going in s works so we keep it lit you can see how we move the city from the west side to the east Ooh, you can feel it how we leave through it's all about the youth change the world through the tunes Make the world to a better place and S works what we do. Social works, work, social works, work, social works, work, social. Organization, we stopping no Satan and open my we call it works. Action on Taylor, the killer verse. I do on my foot in my city hurt. They killing my babies, it's going crazy. I pray for my city to reimburse. Run the schools for the kids. Where the city at we lady? All I know is it's work.